Oregon company Akimoto is a bit of a unique beast. Not only is it one of a handful of automakers in the EV world to have successfully completed an IPO without the help of any special purpose acquisition company, but it also has managed to produce a vehicle that seemingly breaks all of the rules, deciding to focus on small three-wheel limited range electric vehicles with few creature comforts and no rapid charging. Yet, as I discovered earlier this year, when I drove the Arkimoto FUV for the weekend, the two-seat, three-wheel tadpole is exactly what the moniker of its backronym suggests. A fun utility vehicle. On paper, it shouldn't make you smile so much. On paper, it shouldn't make you want to take it over a conventional car. And thanks to its width, it's got all of the fun of a motorcycle, but very few of the benefits. Yet I fell in love because, as I said at the time, it wasn't trying to be a car. It wasn't trying to be a motorcycle. It was just being itself. And for its honesty and simplicity, I couldn't help but love it. At least when its price comes down from the touching 20 grand that you'll spend today to the 12 or so that the CEO of the company hopes to achieve in the not too distant future, thanks to economies of scale, improved, more streamlined manufacturing and the guidance of Sandy Munro from Munro and Associates. Then in July this year, the day after I'd moved to Oregon and met my boss face to face for only the second time, some of the team from this channel headed to the Portland International Raceway, where we attended the FUV and Friends Day. We saw plenty of interesting and novel takes on the Arkimoto, from its deliverator and rapid responder to a semi-autonomous robo-taxi and pickup truck. I got to drive the FUV for the first time, experience a prototype FUV fitted with a phenomenal torque vectoring power steering system from Staffel Systems, and both Nikki and I got to try out the Arkimoto Roadster, a topless, cruiser-inspired trike you need a motorcycle license to ride. Unlike the FUV, which has absolutely zero storage options for the person at the front, this does have a storage tank in front of the driver. It's big enough for bottles, bags, keys, wallets, phones, you name it, but it's not big enough for a full-size crash helmet. Underneath the passenger seat, there is a truly enormous amount of space that's currently not being used but you can't put anything in there because it would just fall through the gaps once you got going. At the rear, however, there is a place for you to bolt a saddlebag if you have one, and the luggage space at the rear on the platform is truly impressive. I was able to get a full-size camera bag on it earlier this week. You get an official top speed of 75 miles per hour, 121 kilometers per hour, Though I think both Nikki and I have seen speeds that started with a different number, maybe the number eight. 100 miles, 160 kilometers of city range, though that drops fast as speed climbs, with Arkimoto saying to expect just 32 miles of range at 70 miles an hour. You get seating for two, heated seats and a heated driver's hand grips, two motors driving the front wheels, three kilowatt AC charging for a level two charger, and a wheelbase that is about a foot longer than a smart car. And today, it's time for us to let you know our thoughts. So Winter, we've had the Roadsters now for a week and I don't know about you, but I've been finding excuses to take it out on the road at every opportunity. I very much have done the same. I mean, I, I've put about 400 miles on it in the time I've had it. Yes, I put probably about 600 miles on it. Included time when I was going to the Ford Mustang Marquis -E GT performance launch and so I decided to just 
take it to the airport at like four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> as you do. I managed to get my my small overnight suitcase strapped onto the back seat, and then I put my camera bag on the back of the luggage rack. Although I will tell you, at four o'clock in the morning, coming down from the mountains, I was very glad for the heated grips on this thing. I have used it to run errands, to go, I put a tail bag from one of my motorcycles on the back of it, and I went grocery shopping a few times. But I also have just gone out to have fun. One thing that I think we need to call out Archimoto on is the way that this is marketed and the way that people that I've spoken to have said, oh yeah, it's like a, like a motorbike, it's very easy to ride. I don't think it is. No, I, I would agree, coming from a motorcyclist perspective, the techniques you need to ride the roadster are really different than a motorcycle. And in fact, some of them are absolutely opposite. Yeah. So like steering, you can't counter steer on this. No, no. And in fact, oh, when I think about riding a motorcycle, especially at speed, I think about steering as something that is very finessed. You apply a little bit of pressure on the handlebar in the direction you want to go. The bike falls a little bit, you and you turn, and it's all very graceful and easy. But on one of these, there is absolutely nothing graceful and nothing easy about steering a roadster. It is a very brute force machine to steer, and you're not counter steering at all. You know, if I want to go, I'm going to turn right now. And to do that, I'm going to push very, very hard on my left handlebar and I'm going to pull a bit on my right handlebar. If I did that in a motorcycle, it would be a disaster. One of the big things to me is that these are somewhat prone to snap over steer if you ease off in a corner. And when you put a pillion on the back, you really have to watch out for the snap over steer way more. So my experience of this tadpole this week is that it has understeered at every single opportunity and now you're saying it's oversteering it's the worst understeering vehicle i've ever encountered i think but that's because it's a tadpole that's what tadpoles do yeah however if you're in a corner and you're like oh i went into this corner too hot and you ease off the throttle or you hit like hard or you hit the regen it wants to snap oversteer like an mr2 or a or a you know, VW Beetle, where all of a sudden that rear end wants to rotate around on you. And if you put a pillion on the back, you feel that a lot more. Now, I haven't, I, I haven't gotten in trouble. It hasn't really bit me, but I could feel it wanting to. I had you on last night as a pillion passenger and I felt pretty secure. That said, I, I think I remember telling you at the time, I moved my body weight right forward and I kind of sat in a more upright grippy the tank position like I would on a motorbike. Now you said as a passenger, I live up in the mountains, so a mountain pass down to the freeway. You said you didn't like that very much. I think from a pillion passenger perspective, there are things that could be done to make it better. There needs to be something to hold on to because the range of the bike, you can't really hold on to your rider when you're the pillion. But there also isn't much that you can hold on to in terms of rails because they're awfully low and don't give you very good leverage. On the highway, it's very comfortable as a pillion, which I think gets to one of the weird conundrums about this machine, which is that I feel like this machine is most at home cruising on the freeway, which is exactly where this machine really is not built to be because it just doesn't have the battery range at, at highway speeds. I think, and we've talked about this, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in our conclusion, that if this machine leaned, like if the wheels stayed stable, the front wheel stayed stable, and the body could, could pivot and lean, this machine would be one of the most amazing to ride ever. The other thing that I've noticed is there's nothing really to grip. We've got the faux tank, uh, <laughs> but we don't have really anything else to grip hold of. And because your feet are not on pegs, your feet are just resting on the footboards, there's nothing that you can hook your heel around, which I think, hmm. I think is something that as a, a biker, I really enjoy having. So, I mean, acceleration is one of those things that I think is really worth talking about with this machine, because this machine is not quick off the line at all. 
Uh, not like, for instance, my Zero, which right. is wicked fast off the line. Off the line, you like an FUV. You have a real limit to how much power it'll let you have. You don't get... If you open the throttle all the way, you still don't get full power until you hit probably about 30 miles an hour. Uh-huh. And there are times when it feels slow to me. One thing we haven't talked about yet, which I know has bugged you and it's bugged me, is the brightness of the display. Obviously, in the FUV, which has got a roof over the top, the display brightness is just fine. But when you're out on a day like today, and you're driving through a road like this on a bright, sunny day, I don't know about you, but I want to have my dipped headlights on. And if I turn my dipped headlights on, I basically lose the information on the dash because the dash dims automatically. Yeah. And if you're in a helmet and you've got a visor down, which you and I both do, then you can't see it if the sun is directly in front of you. I really like having those side marker lights on. And to do that, unless it's actively nighttime, you basically have to sacrifice your display to do it. And that irritates me. I really like the riding experience. I know I've complained a little bit about the the fact that it's not immediately intuitive, either from a car driver or a motorcyclist perspective. And frankly, I think that Akimoto should run classes so that people who want to get one learn how to ride it and drive it properly. Mm -hmm. But I also think that this is just a bundle of laughs. And in terms of the actual riding experience. I think that this is a a vehicle that you're gonna want to ride again and again and again. Yeah. I, it's not something that you're gonna grow tired of. I think that would be true if you're a biker. I think if you were a car person, I think you might eventually grow tired of this. But as a bike person, I think it's just hilariously good fun. It really is. I mean, it is just so much fun. One thing I've noticed about riding the Roadster is how much attention you get. Oh, goodness, yes. Not to mention when you stop someplace. <laughs> Last time I took this thing grocery shopping, and I think I spent as long in the parking lot explaining it to excited people as I did <laughs> getting my damn groceries. I mean, it is just... And then when you tell people... It's made in Oregon. Obviously, we are based in Oregon. There's definitely a lot of pride in oh, something yeah. that's made in Oregon. I had someone say to me, like, so is it from China? And I said, no, it's it's made in Eugene. He, his eyes got really white. I said, really? I said, yeah. He said, they make this here in Oregon. Yep, they do. So we've had the FUVs now for... Two weeks, actually. Two weeks, yep. We were supposed to go back last week, but Akimoto were really kind and let us have an extra week because the weather last week was abysmal. We'd both been away for trips. So what excuse are we going to give to try to get it for another week? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because you want to keep it. I do. I, I really like having it and I really enjoy it. And I, I'll admit, I find it a little bit hard to explain why. Honestly, I feel that this is the most stable arrangement I've ever had. Mm -hmm. Does it have handling problems? If you're coming from a bike and you expect it to handle like a bike? Absolutely. No, I'm sorry. If you're coming from a car, it also has handling problems. Well, yes, but if you're coming from a car and you're not a biker, then, well, it's going to feel weird anyway. This is a vehicle that I don't think is designed for people like us. No. And I don't mean middle-aged, overweight people. I mean <laughs> so at gap riders. I do think, actually, for overweight, middle-aged people, it's not bad it's at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is... So one of the things that we've talked a fair bit about with this machine is how much it's an FUV with a different body on it. And right. that shows up, I think, in the way that it doesn't really feel like it was designed for at gap riders. Um, I would also pay to have the brake pedal moved backwards. So the brake pedal has to be moved. The current position of the brake pedal is, is absolutely unacceptable to me. I mean, my motorcycle boots 
make working the brake pedal on that thing a bit awkward. The brake pedal's just too close to the firewall. My back protector interferes oh God, yeah, with, with, the that, seat. with that rear seat a bit. The other thing that stands out is there's a couple of features that at this price point, I feel like are... <laughs> what? Well, I know which feature I'd get rid of. What feature would you get rid of? The, the flasher, which isn't a flasher. Yeah, all right. So talk about that for a sec. So most modern motorcycles, on the left-hand handlebar, there's a headlight flasher. You've yes. got your headlight controls that you, you flip with your thumb. You've got your indicators. Some bikes have hazards, which this one does. And then kind of around the front, there's a little flasher button. On most modern motorcycles, you hit that and it will flash the high beams. And because the switch gear on this is just off of like an ATV, it has that little button. Except it's the engine start button. Yeah, and what happens if you press and hold that while you're riding? It kills the bike. Yeah. And then you have to stomp on the brake pedal to power cycle it to get it to come back on again. So and you have to be in neutral. And you have to be stopped. Because I come from mostly having ridden antique motorcycles that didn't have the flasher button that hasn't tripped me up at all but i know it's tripped you up it, it caught me off at a, a set of traffic lights once where i flashed someone you thought you were flashing someone and then the bike just went Mew. and i was like oh it's not working i have to put my hazards on and then there's like this panicked moment where i'm going what the heck did i do it's not working anymore and i've just got the the boot logo because <laughs> it also has a kill switch it does so, so it doesn't really need both we have not seen any evidence that this machine has ABS. At this price point, ABS should be an absolute given. And to be honest, in modern motorcycling, at this price point, so should traction control. Um, and you and I disagree on this, but I think at this price point, in the motorcycle market, cruise control is basically a bog sand feature. You'd be hard pressed to buy a motorcycle for 18 or 20 grand today that didn't have cruise control. I've never had a motorcycle with cruise Neither control. Neither have I. Um, I haven't either. And it's not saying that I terribly miss most of the time. Occasionally I do. My wrist gets sore. But I'm just saying it has fly-by-wire throttle. Right. It costs, you know, nearly 20 grand. Cruise control would be a thing that would make sense to have. And ABS is saying it absolutely should have. I would love to have DC quick charging on this. You know what? I thought about that. I would love to have DC quick charging, but I honestly think if it could charge at seven kilowatts from an AC station, even that would be a really big deal. You could park at a, at a you know, level two charger and recoup a lot of power pretty quickly. I don't know about yours, but mine, even plugged into a 110 outlet, sounds like someone's running a vacuum cleaner at full blast <laughs> much of the time that it's charging. It sings the songs of its people. On my garage is below my apartment, and from my bedroom, you can hear the Arkhamoto going whoosh when it's charging. <laughs> The first night I had it, thought I, you know, I messaged the team. I was like, is this OK? I really thought something was wrong. So what, how much range have you got out of it? If I get, if I get 70 miles, I'm super happy. I got 80 out of it once. And I'm guessing there wasn't a lot of motorway. No, no. Yeah. There are some build quality issues right now. Yeah. A couple of imperfections in the kind of the front the casting. Yeah. Front casting. And they have to, for, in the name of all that's holy, put a real key on it. <laughs> it's comically bad. But there was one other area that we noticed, and we actually said to the CEO of, of Arkimoto in a communication this week, uh, hey, had you thought about adding storage space behind that passenger seat? The, the original FUV design has the battery pack quite low down because you've got to get the, your feet over it yeah. when you're in the enclosed cabin. But the seat on that is far, far higher than it is in the FUV. And so there's that much space At underneath the, the passenger seat that you could turn into another storage bin that would actually be larger than the front one. Yes, although, to be honest, I would love to see the step over space as an optional extra on that vehicle. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but here's why. 
if you could lose that really useful front storage space, right? If you could get that to almost a flat floor, that would be really accessible for someone who maybe can't ride a motorcycle anymore because of mobility or balance issues. I think there's a real untapped market for Arkhamodo with the FUV and the Roadster for people with mobility impairments. And a lot of people who ride trikes ride trikes yeah. because they have mobility issues or balance using issues. Yeah. a two-wheeled vehicle. Mm -hmm. If that lead, and to be clear, Arkhamodo bought a company that specialises in leaning three-wheelers. Oh, it's coming. So I think that with leaning could be on the horizon. It's coming. It's, if it that could lean, it would be fantastic. I said at the FUV and Friends Day that the Roadster felt like driving the platform on which everything was built. And I still kind of feel that way a little bit. I think that it, it doesn't need a lot to give it its own identity. There are multiple different types of vehicles that we review every year. There are yeah. the ones that we want to keep. Yeah. They're the ones that we want to hand back. Yeah. There are the ones that we can't wait to get rid of. <laughs> uh, and then there are the ones that you want to hide. And I think you and I are both in that last category with this one. Yeah, I am. When I picked it up and rode it home, I was like, all right. Fine, this will be a thing I do for a week and then it turned into two weeks. But as I got more and more time on it and I got better at using it and better at riding it and I I just came to really, really love it. I, I really did and it, it, it totally blindsided me how much I like this machine because I can see so many things about it that should be better. But I just... The whole is so much more than the sum of its parts. It's such a fabulous, fabulous piece of machinery. So there you have it, the Arkimoto Roadster FUV Winter. Have you had fun? I have had so much fun with this thing. Thanks so much to Arkimoto for hooking us up with not one, but two Roadsters for two whole weeks. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew. Go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreon supporters, David Janakula, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahawa, Brophy Wolf, Tazlet in the Gong, I just dropped my glove, Sean Ueda, Gordon C, Raging Fellows, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ricky Leon, Brian Newton, Laura Sanborn, Rory Litwin and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude goes to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. They are John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnik, Christopher Lee Jones, Paul Conray, Ellery Hennersley, and Ian. And a special welcome to those of you who have just joined the Transport Evolved Patreon family. We have been doing a lot in the last couple of weeks and Erin has been busy on a top secret project. So we haven't been able to do any new animations yet, but we will be very shortly. So if your name is not in the list, fear not, it will be added very soon. Don't forget you can support us through Patreon, Bitcoin and Ko-fi. And if you'd like to see us do more crazy things like this, let us know in the comments below. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. And I'm Winter Tashlin. And as always, keep, keep evolving. evolving. You know the scene of a felt so good I want to drown in your holy water I couldn't help <laughs> Where does it go? What was it? Stink bug This ain't no heartbreak This ain't no heartbreak This ain't break your heart Moved to Oregon and my <sighs> I Words. Just camera shot just as you yeah. Words. <laughs> what are they? I fell in love because as I said at the time, 
The teleprompter is f***ed. <laughs> we are okay. Sometimes. Winter, either VO or in person. The road to specs aren't really any different from an Arkhamoto FUVs. You get what? <laughs> I had to advance the teleprompter. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the FUV, which has absolutely zeroage, zeroage, zeroage. I got distracted by the really cute chipmunk that's running across the road. Oh, no. Did you see it? Oh, it's like, it. oh, <laughs> run! We should just put some of these at the end of the video, like Alec does at Technology yes, Connections. Please. Yes.